Today's apologists claim microevolution is real, but not macroevolution. Young Earth creationists have long been opposed to evolutionary theory for several reasons. Primarily that it contradicts biblical literalism, particularly Genesis, and it means that humans are just another species of animal. Instead, they believe that their god created all animals in a single event, let them multiply across the globe, then drowned all but two or so of each kind in a worldwide flood, and then once again let them propagate over the earth. However, problems with that idea have existed since long before Darwin's time. Creationists realized that there are far too many animal species on the planet to be able to fit two of each species on the ark described in the Bible. Also, we've long been able to observe evolution occurring through breeding programs and in nature as a result of environmental pressures. As the evidence kept piling up, creationists could no longer deny that evolution occurs, so they sought a way to reconcile those problems with the claims in the Bible. The terms microevolution and macroevolution are biological terms that have been in use since 1927. Microevolution means evolutionary change within a species, and macroevolution refers to evolution at or above the species level. Given enough time and selective pressure, microevolution becomes macroevolution. About 50 years later, creationists started incorrectly using the terms to refer to biblical kinds instead of species. Basically, they believe that species can evolve within the biblical kind designation, but that some type of barrier prevents evolution from continuing beyond that level. Unfortunately for them, the term kind isn't defined in the Bible. So creationists have tried to come up with a definition that is broad enough to reduce the number of animals on Noah's Ark from millions to a much more credible few thousand animals, but narrow enough to deny macroevolution as they define it. As a result, many creationists settle on the family taxonomic category as the definition of a kind. Ironically, such a broad category would require all the kinds to reproduce at such a breakneck pace after the flood that a thousand families would have had to evolve into the millions of species we see today. And to account for the diversity of species seen in mummified remains, ancient art and literature, and so on, and to account for the fact that there is no recent historical evidence of any such rapid evolution occurring, all those millions of species would have had to evolve within a few hundred years of the flood supposedly occurring. The example I like to use to illustrate this point is that the single cat kind would have had to evolve into lions, tigers, leopards, snow leopards, cheetahs, caracals, mountain lions, wildcats, lynxes, bobcats, jaguars, jaguarundis, ocelots, servals, saber-toothed cats, domestic cats, and the rest of the 13 cat genera, 40 cat species, and hundreds of subspecies. And all that evolution occurred at the same time all over the world, only to suddenly slow way down to the pace we see today once better record-keeping developed. There's just no evidence for any of that. Another problem with the creationist concept of macroevolution is that there is no evidence of this supposed barrier preventing evolution from continuing beyond any taxonomic level. Creationists will point to the fact that we don't see species today evolving at higher taxonomic levels, like family, order, class, etc. Many will even deny that we see evolution at the species level, even though we definitely do. Considering that, on average, it takes nature a million years to evolve a new species that persists, that should come as no surprise. But that doesn't mean there isn't evidence for macroevolutionary change above even the family level. It just means we have to look at our oldest evidence, which is the fossil record. And there are many good examples I could give, but the evolution of whales demonstrates this rather well. Starting in 50 million year old strata in Pakistan, we find Pakasitis, a wolf-like mammal that lived on land. Then, as we go up through the geological layers, we see a series of increasingly aquatic fossil species, 
first becoming more otter-like, then more seal-like, then completely aquatic, increasing in size and diversifying, and eventually becoming the whales and dolphins we see today. And the reason we can be so certain they are all related is because all these species possess the same distinctive thickened ear bones that improve hearing underwater. This feature is found only in the species within this lineage. In addition, the nostrils in the earliest species were located on the front of the snout and gradually moved in each successive species farther up the snout to the top of the head, culminating in the familiar cetacean blowhole. Meanwhile, the eyes moved from the top of the head down to the sides. Their bodies also became increasingly streamlined and developed powerful tails, and their hind legs shrank, losing their ability to walk on land and eventually disappearing altogether. Their pelvis also shrank, separating from the spine and becoming vestigial. That fossil series from small wolf-like land mammal to a massive, fully aquatic baleen whale is a clear illustration of macroevolution. It's arguably the most dramatic example of it, but we see many other examples in the fossil record, including fish to amphibian, theropod dinosaur to bird, and early primate to human. Of course, creationists deny all of these examples of macroevolution because it doesn't fit their predetermined conclusion of biblical creation, but these are precisely the kinds of examples of macroevolution that we would expect to find in the fossil record if evolutionary theory is true. And when the evidence clearly contradicts a conclusion, it's the conclusion that needs to change, not the evidence.